with the 101 in this super flex rookie mock draft. Obviously, it is B. John Robinson. There's no one else it can be. He has been the 101 since 2022, since January, February, March, April. It doesn't matter, right? B. John Robinson is the best prospect in this class. He is a running back that could go in the top 10 of the NFL draft. When you watch him play, there is quite literally nothing he cannot do. He breaks tackles. He has vision to uh, turn plays backside. He has the receiving ability of a wide receiver. I mean, the man quite literally does everything. And I don't think there's any scenario. There is no landing spot. There is no outcome where he is not the 101. I, I don't think there's a path there for me, at least. Is there for you? No, I don't think so. Unless he falls to like the back half of day two <laughs> or like the second round, back half of the second round. I don't know. But like we were drafting Jonathan Taylor back in 2020 over Joe Burrow, you know, and, and like that was a very popular pick back then in Superflex Leagues, too. So I don't, Bijan Robinson's the 1.01. He's basically a perfect prop prospect in my, uh, my marker system for running backs. Like there is really just, Nothing more that needs to be said about him. So I think I'm just going to move right over to my pick, the 1.02. Yeah. And I'm going to take Bryce Young. Nothing has changed for me here. Um, he is my quarterback one in this class. Uh, he is my 1.02. Bryce Young, to me, the only problem I think that you can even have with him is his size. The fact that he's literally like the same size as me, but he's playing quarterback for the NFL. Going to be the first or second overall pick to the Panthers or the Texans. Um, that, to me, that doesn't really matter because when you look at everything else that he does, you're talking about like the pocket presence, the accuracy, the arm strength is solid too. the production that he had at Alabama with really only one first round pick like CJ Stroud has thrown to four, potentially five first round picks in two years. And Bryce Young has thrown to just one, which was Jameson Williams. And then a couple other guys that are have been or will potentially be second rounders and has paced him if or beat him in total career production and in best season production so to me i'm not trying to overthink bryce young's size i just think that he's a very talented quarterback i think he's going to be phenomenal and he's going to be the first or second quarterback off the board and should be the first quarterback off the board in super flex rookie drafts absolutely and this is one of those things where people will get worked up about the size you just mentioned it people will get panicked and all these other items but here's the thing. The NFL is about to tell you if it matters or if it doesn't. And spoiler, it doesn't matter at all because he's the favorite to go first overall to the Carolina Panthers. So I don't, I just don't care about the size. And the tiebreaker for me, we've talked about this before, is while he may not have like six, 700 yard rushing upside, he does carry more rushing ability than CJ Stroud just by the nature of his game. So that little bit of a tiebreaker is what puts me with, or it's what puts Bryce Young ahead of CJ Stroud for me still. So at the 103, it's going to be CJ Stroud, right? Again, he is just behind Bryce Young. And CJ Stroud may be the best NFL capable quarterback in this draft class from a just pure talent perspective. But for fantasy, like I said, that rushing, it has to come into play. It has to be a factor, right? If Bryce Young is rushing for 300 to 400 yards and CJ Stroud is. 200 yards, that makes a difference at the end of the season. I think C.J. Stroud may very well have the best career as well, but when you are so heavily reliant on passing, you have to be a prolific passer to matter for fantasy, to like truly be a difference maker. Think Joe Burrow, right? Joe Burrow is not running for 500 yards a season, but he's capable of dropping right 4,500 yards and 40 touchdowns. That's what C.J. Stroud has to do in order to actually hit uh, to pay off at this draft capital. And that's the only reason he's 103 instead of 102. The one thing that we kind of underrate about CJ Stroud too, is that I think he's the safest quarterback prospect in this entire class. Like when you look at what CJ Stroud brings to the table, he is a, just a prototypical pocket passer. He doesn't have any size issues. He's a phenomenal thrower. Uh, he is uh, like pinpoint accuracy threads, the needle on so many throws on tape. Um, he, he does have, the capability to rush it's really not what he wants to do but that's not really you know a, a bad thing either like you just mentioned joe burrow can be really good we saw tua have stretches obviously with tyreek and Jalen waddle where he's not running the ball and he's still throwing for 303 and all that kind of stuff he is the safest quarterback in this entire class so i don't really fault anybody for just wanting to have that safety like if he ends up being Kirk cousins i don't think that you're necessarily 
upset. I don't think you're really ecstatic, even though Kirk Cousins has been a back end QB one for the past like three, four, five years. He is solid, yeah. But it's just I don't think that you're excited about that drafting him at the 1.03. But that is still just a very good safe outcome where Bryce Young, yeah, maybe the size is an issue. Anthony Richardson, maybe the accuracy and all that other stuff is an issue, and his career is only two, three, four years. He doesn't get a second contract. You know, Will Levis has all those other problems that everybody likes to talk about too. If you just want to take Stroud, I don't necessarily blame you just from the pure safety aspect of it. So at the 1.04 here, sticking with the quarterback position, I am going to take Anthony Richardson here. He just has the the ultimate ceiling, the, the ultimate, you know, the next Lamar Jackson, the next Cam Newton. That is what Anthony Richardson possesses. He also has just a horribly low destructive crippling floor that is really really scary to look at but i think one of the benefits of anthony richardson something that i've been warming up to a lot is i like anthony richardson the dynasty asset i don't necessarily like anthony richardson the player but i like the asset because when you look at these types of players we have i think we have a couple examples over the past couple of years of these highly regarded prospects who have like ceilings to just be positional advantages and and fantasy breakers trey lance maybe not to the same extent but i think as the same sort of like man if he hits in this kyle shanahan offense with the rushing ability that he has trey lance could still be phenomenal for fantasy football top five ceiling and trey lance in his third year after playing like three games can still be traded for a mid first round pick right now i think that you could easily go get Trey Lance or sell Trey Lance for a mid first round pick right now. That's the kind of value that he's had that has just stayed insulated over his career. I think Kyle Pitts is another example of that. Kyle Pitts essentially hasn't given you the elite production that we've wanted out of him. Obviously he had a thousand yards in his rookie season, only scored one touchdown, not good fantasy production last year. Didn't have good fantasy production with Mariota then got injured, but his value is still insulated. He has been a phenomenal asset that basically at any point in his career you could have moved off of him very easily for a lot of other things and i think that's what anthony richardson represents here is a player that is very safe and has very insulated dynasty value that if he doesn't pan out somebody's going to be willing to buy in a year or two because he's anthony richardson he still has the ceiling but what if anthony richardson hits now you just hit on you know the next fantasy breaker the next lamar the next cam newton at 1.04 and you are just winning dynasty championships i mean this is a it's a big turnaround from where i think you and i started back in february when we did this first one i think i took him 107 108 and that was with the idea or the caveat that he was selected in the back half of the first it feels like i mean he's a lock for the top 11 right put that cut off at the titans most likely so what anthony richardson has done is basically proven to at least NFL executives, he is worth taking a shot on, and we have to react accordingly, right? If somebody wants to take him at 103, 102, I get it. Like, again, because everything you just said, we already know quarterbacks are volatile. They're hard to predict. They're extremely hard to hit on. And why not take the ultimate upside swing, right? I'm still not going to take him over Bijan, but Anthony Richardson possesses the ability to win fantasy leagues for the next decade if he so chooses. So, that is going to be a very interesting outcome and where he actually lands is going to be, I think, one of the bigger stories of the NFL draft. Before continuing, though, I wanted to mention that if you like this content and want to support what we're doing on this channel, please consider joining our YouTube memberships where you will gain access to additional videos every single month, including a bank of seven videos that you can watch already. Plus, we will be starting exclusive live streams when we have enough members. And I just posted a link to a Google Sheet that houses all of the data that I'm looking at for my marker system, everything that you want for running backs and wide receivers, it's all in that Google Sheet. So if you want access to all of that, check out the link in the description down below, join the bonus content tier, and thank you guys for checking it out. With the 105, we're gonna get away from the quarterback position and we're gonna go to my wide receiver one, Addison's wide receiver one. It is Jackson Smith and Jigba. And honestly, this has been our wide receiver one for several months, right? This is not a change. What is a change though, is I'm now taking him over Jameer Gibbs. And the reason is JSN has proven just through testing, his pro day, the combine, all of it, that he has the capability of being a top 12 wide receiver. 
extremely quickly. I think he's going to come in and be extremely pro ready from day one. He literally, I mean, his floor feels like it is Keenan Allen from that, his ability to get open underneath the ability to win wherever you put him pretty much. And he's just pretty damn hard to cover, whether it's press man or zone, as we saw in reception perception, he has proven he is already probably a top 15 wide receiver in the NFL, as far as dynasty is concerned. And he very well could push much higher. I think by the end of the season, we always say take the best player available, but who's the best player available between Jackson Smith and Jigbo and Jameer Kibbs. Couldn't tell you. <laughs> it, it, it's going to be, I think, a coin flip in terms of who is actually going to have the better career. But I think that there is something to say about the safety of JSN, just in terms of the wide receiver position. I think he is just so clear-cut the best wide receiver in this class, and it's not even really close. I think you can make an argument that just like positionally, it's better to take JSN here and then potentially try to get a running back later because that running back could be a little bit closer to Jameer Gibbs than any other wide receiver is to JSN. So I don't necessarily hate that argument either for taking him over Gibbs. I I, I like this. I think a lot of people are going to have JSN at one of five. I think JSN could potentially go ahead of some of these quarterbacks we just took. Like He is proving out to be, I think, probably the safest pick outside of B. John Robinson in this rookie class. And what will really end up happening is landing spot will dictate JSN versus Gibbs. And we always talk about, right, make your tiers so you don't fall into the trap of, you know, falling in love with a landing spot. But Gibbs and JSN are in the same tier. So mm -hmm. that can be your tiebreaker, right? Obviously, you don't have to do this until we know landing spot. So that should hopefully shake this out for you. All right, so moving over to my pick at the 1.06, I'm going to dip back into the quarterback pool here for the last time in this first round. And I'm going to take Will Levis. And and I know some of you out there are probably like, oh, like Will Levis, 1.06 over Jameer Gibbs. Like, that's really disgusting. But it's so gross. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah, so I, gross. I get it. But I've bought into Will Levis, the, the type of player in the ceiling that he can have. And maybe this is just me, like, in my head, have the perfect situation where he's going to go to the Indianapolis Colts. He's going to be the new Jalen Hurts in a Shane Steichen offense with Jonathan Taylor, with Michael Pittman. It just feels like that is such an ideal situation with him going top five, maybe even ahead of Anthony Richardson. And if that sort of situation does play out, I think he has to be a top six pick. I think that you are grossly over-exaggerating how bad of a prospect Will Levis is if that's what the NFL is telling us that they think of Will Levis. One of the biggest uh, pros in Will Levis's corner is when you look at the 2021 season, he had uh, an offense with Jack Cohn, who was coming from the LA Rams under Sean McVay, who is now back with the LA Rams right now. He actually said that that offense that he ran in Kentucky in 2021 is basically the exact same offense that they ran with Matthew Stafford. NFL pro style offense he basically said that they gave will levis three plays in the huddle one play to actually run a couple other plays to check to based on how the defenses were that if that is really true and that's what will levis can handle at the collegiate level i don't think he really has any issues translating to an nfl pro style offense especially in a shane steichen offense who already knows how to utilize a player with will levis's skill sets as a dual threat big bodied and, and i mean when you're looking at what they what the eagles did with jalen hurts like yeah. they just get down inside the five they run that little like that push play like qb that bs sneak. qb sneak yeah that is still <laughs> legal right now if they're gonna do that with will levis dude he could be a top 10 quarterback he's not even trying like, on that could, alone <laughs> he could throw for 2500 yards and, and 15 touchdowns and he's still gonna be a top 10 quarterback so he's gonna have Six, seven, eight hundred yards, you know, eight, nine, ten <laughs> rushing touchdowns. Boom. I mean, so th that is the recipe for success. The issue is while they were giving him all this stuff to do, right? I just felt like he still was not a good processor. He's not a great decision maker. All of these things, when you watch his tape, it's just littered with like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> he'll make a throw and you're like, what is happening? What are you seeing? that everybody else is seeing like it does does it none a lot of it didn't add up and then on top of it and i saw this as a narrative floated out there and i think it's interesting is like he he's coming off of a very very good 2021 he could have entered the nfl draft in arguably the worst qb class we have seen in a decade if not longer he chooses to come back to college 
which is interesting. And then he comes out and has a very average year, obviously, with the issues in the offensive line for Kentucky. Doesn't live up. So now his draft stock has risen. And I'm just trying to place that narrative and see how that makes sense right after transferring because he was sucked behind Sean Clifford at Penn State. So there's a lot of these like narrative-based items that are just interesting. And then when you top it all off, the dude's just weird. He's, a, <laughs> he's just a weirdo. <laughs> I mean, you've seen the mayo in the coffee. You've seen him eating bananas with the peel. And he was like, he a weird selfie of his back where he's flexing. He's absolutely just ripped. I'm, he's just a weird dude. And there's, that shouldn't factor into my analysis, but it's starting to. And I just don't love the idea of him at 106, especially over Gibbs, Charbonnet, and Jordan Addison. Those are the three. I'd, I'd push him back behind those three. And then, yeah, I think you have to take him. But there's enough going on there that I have a lot of questions about Will Levis. So moving away from the quarterback position at the 107, I am taking Jameer Gibbs, right? The guy we've talked about two or three times already now finally goes off the board. Just like with Bryce Young, really the only concern is the size. Right, he comes in at 199 pounds, one pound below that 200 pound threshold that we love to talk about. But with that, he brings right a BMI just under 30, which while it technically doesn't hit on the marker system, I'm fine with like a 29.4 BMI. I can live with that. He has the 4.3 speed. He has the elite receiving ability. And while he may not be a stud between the tackles, He is a more than capable rusher. So I'm not overly concerned about those types of items. There's already been talks of him slipping into the back end of the first, right? The early second at the latest feels like a lock. That kind of draft capital is telling me everything I need to know. The size doesn't really matter or the size concerns that people like to bring up don't really matter all that much. And Jameer Gibbs is just poised to either be right? The next Alvin Kamara, the next DeAndre Swift, but healthy, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. I think he is set to have a phenomenal career in the NFL. I 100% agree. I love Jameer Gibbs. I don't have any issues with the size whatsoever. I know people want to say, well, just because the pounds doesn't have a number two in front of it, that automatically places him in this bucket of running backs that don't succeed at the NFL level. But I mean, I get that. Like there needs to be a defined cutoff at some point, but also 199 versus 200 and then when there's a lot of other running backs who are under 205 like that's like one big like big mac away meal for jameer gibbs from just being a 202 203 like that's all we needed from him and if you want to talk about size concerns the rb1 and two in points per game last year were christian mccaffrey and austin eckler christian mccaffrey's 511 205 austin eckler came in was he 58 or 59 uh 200 and then he they both bulked up post bulked up. combine post NFL draft. So if you think they can't succeed, the two best fantasy running backs in the NFL last season were essentially his size coming in. I'll give you two more of those examples. Number one is LaShawn McCoy was five foot 10, 198. And Jamal Charles was five eleven, two hundred. 200. And Jamal Charles also ran a four, three, eight, 40, um, obviously is a phenomenal receiver. Uh, all that kind of stuff. It, it's just, it seems like, when put you him in compare, Kansas City. Oh, put him dude. in Kansas City. <laughs> I yeah, I would love that so much. I know that we have the sting of Clyde Edwards Hilaire, but Jameer Gibbs oh, is not Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I'll fall for it again. I don't care. A hundred percent. I would love that. I, I just think that we need to when we are talking about Jameer Gibbs and placing him in certain buckets of players that haven't succeeded at the NFL level, we're not taking to, into account the overall prospect that Jameer Gibbs is right. and That's just so much piece. better than everybody else who was coming in at 195, 190, all these other, this bucket of of running backs that aren't prototypically sized running backs. Jameer Gibbs is a phenomenal prospect despite that size and should be treated as such. So with the 1.08, sticking at the running back position, we're going to take the RB3 in this draft, but I'm going to throw a curveball at y'all. It's not Sean Tucker. I'm taking Zach Charbonnet here at my Mm. RB3. Um, And the primary reason for that is because I'm, as of right now, I'm leaning into what the NFL is telling me. I think Zach Charbonnet is a locked and loaded second round pick. And especially if he goes to a really good landing spot, he should be, I think, the RB3 in this class. I just really, really like Sean Tucker. I'm hopeful for it, but I'm very prepared to move Charbonnet to my locked and loaded RB3 and be wanting to take him here at the 1.08 in every single Superflex League. He is just 
a phenomenal running back. He has great contact balance, great power. He has really good receiving ability. He's got the size. He's got good speed for that size. Just kind of everything that you want from like a very good running back. That is what Zach Charbonnet is. And he's not the sexiest of players. When you watch him, he just gets the job done. He does everything perfectly well. I just want him to go somewhere that's going to just feed him 250 carries plus another opportunities for 40, 50, 60 targets where he can get into the 40 reception range. You know, I think that we are talking about a player that has a Kenneth Walker level of ceiling and hype without the Kenneth Walker current hype as of right now compared to what he had last year. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen people float out as a comp, basically a more athletic uh, David Montgomery, which I don't disagree with because Dave Montgomery is not elite at anything. And I, I don't, don't think Zach Charbonnet is necessarily elite at anything, but he has significantly better athleticism. I think he has better contact balance. So, mm -hmm. and I think he's an equally competent receiver because Dave Montgomery was a very good receiver coming out, or it felt like he was at least. So I've seen that comp thrown around. And I don't hate it. I also, but, again, but have you seen the chart? Player. Have you seen the chart though of David Montgomery? Because he's got the feet of Saquon Barkley <laughs> and the vision. So I don't know. This this seems like Charbonnet a weird wishes. Charbonnet, Charbonnet wishes. He wishes. I've seen, that he... <laughs> <laughs> I've seen people throw that out, and it interests me because Dave Montgomery's had very very good stretches for fantasy at least, mm -hmm. and I think Charbonnet's a better player. So that would put Charbonnet, you know, close to a top fifteen, top twelve running back um, if he gets the workload and the ample opportunity. And that very well could happen. Again, I'm going to stick with it. I've seen him mock draft to the Bears several times, you know, middle to late second. And I don't hate that one bit because I think he could run for days, basically with uh, the running lanes that Justin Fields would open up for him. So I think that would be an interesting landing spot. There's a lot of places in the second round I think that he could thrive. At the 109, we finally come back to the wide receiver position. And for me, that is going to be Jordan Addison. He is still my wide receiver too in this class. But if we just look at where we were two months ago compared to today, taking Jordan Addison is a lot less exciting and a lot less fun than it felt two months ago, right? He obviously did not have the world's greatest combine. He ran, you know, the low four fours. People were expecting high four fours, maybe even four threes. He was touted as a truly elite route runner. His reception perception profile came out and it was average at best. So a lot of the things we seem to love about his game have started to fall by the wayside. But when you look at the tape, right, he turned it on from the last two years when he's healthy, he just, he's open constantly. He breaks tackles. He shakes guys in the open field. He is a yak monster. He does all of these things on film that it's just very difficult to move him much further down for me, you know, numbers aside, because my eye is telling me Jordan Addison can and should be a very good wide receiver. And then the biggest note I always have to bring up when I talk about him, he turned Kenny Pickett into a first-round quarterback. That's, that has to mean something. So that will always be the feather in his cap there. But again, Jordan Addison, while he is our wide receiver two or my wide receiver two right now, it is significantly less appealing than wide receiver twos, wide receiver threes, or even fours that we've seen in previous classes. I threw a poll out on Twitter, and I, it was a poll between two prospects wide receiver prospects um, and, and it had all their things like if they're both uh, first round picks they have the, you know their dominator rating their best yards per team pass attempt breakout ages all the stuff that we kind of care about for wide receiver prospects and it was just a blind poll which one of these players do you prefer and the poll voted against Jordan Addison in favor of Jahan Dotson which I think kind of shows you the difference in wide receiver classes over the past two years either we were too low and and are still currently too low on Jahan Dotson as he's going about a round and a half even two rounds after Jordan Addison in startup drafts or Jordan Addison being the fact that he is the wide receiver two in this class that's like you said that doesn't mean the same thing as wide receiver twos in previous classes right. I think that just kind of shows you how not good this wide receiver class overall is when you have yeah. a player like Jordan Addison who comps similarly to what was Dotson like at best the wide receiver five or six last year maybe yeah like what what does that kind of tell you I do think that it's going to be good though that um he is one of only two wide receivers invited to the NFL draft on Thursday night it's him and JSN yep. 
they didn't invite Quentin Johnston. They don't want it to be awkward if he doesn't get picked. But the NFL, at least based on their invite list, believes that Jordan Addison is going to be a first round pick. And if he is, that's a certain amount of confidence and uh, just trust overall and opportunity that he will have on whatever team ends up drafting him. All right, so 110, going back into the running back position, the last running back that we're going to be talking about tonight is, I have. To, I mean, I have to take him. It, it's Sean Tucker. How can I not <laughs> talk about Sean Tucker, who is still currently my RB3? I know I took Zach Charbonnet ahead of him, but I just feel like that's kind of what the NFL is telling me. And like I said, I'm very, very prepared on Saturday to just move Zach Charbonnet to my RB3. But as of right now, mm. I still have to have Sean Tucker, my boy, as my pre-draft rookie RB3 because he has everything that you want from a running back prospect. He has the production at Syracuse. He's got good size. He weighed in at 5'9", 207. Um, he's going to be a a 4'3", player, 4'3", uh, speed type of player at his pro day. I know he put out that like video of like, here's like my pro day kind of thing on Twitter. And he said that in that video, he said he was laser timed at 433 and 439. So even if you take the 439 as his worst speed, 43 player, you want to add some sort of like comp- like time onto that adjustment pro day, he's still sub 445, which is faster than a lot of other running backs in this class and still great for that size. He's got the receiving ability that you like to see um, out of Syracuse, especially at in, in 2022. Just everything that you want out of a running back prospect, Sean Tucker has. The only, the final key is going to be draft capital and ultimately landing spot like i've been hoping and praying for second round draft capital for sean tucker and i've been hoping and praying that it's second round draft capital to the miami dolphins because i think that that would be like just a match made in heaven um if if he goes into the third round i think it's going to be tough to put him into the first round given a lot of the other talent and potential wide receivers that you could have in the first but um i, I just i really need to have Sean Tucker here and potentially talk about him one last time as a first rounder in this class, because I might not get to do that in a week. You are Mr. Sean Tucker. Like there's no other way. (laughs) There's no other way for me to put that. You are the one that put me on to Sean Tucker. I subsequently Mm -hmm. put Marco on to Sean Tucker Mm -hmm. and we've just been waiting for news. And at least now we do have the idea. He is medically cleared and can have a pro day getting over that hurdle pre NFL draft is a massive green flag for him. Like that is what you want to see. It's not going to carry injury questions into the draft. I think damage is probably already done as far as doing nothing over the last basically two months and carrying injury concerns that far with him. If if he goes round three and Quentin Johnston goes round one and Josh Downs goes round two, Zay Flowers as well, right? Those guys have a case to be taken ahead of Sean Tucker. I think he lands in that tier with them just from the type of player he is. Now, if he slips to day three, well, it's a whole different conversation because we know he becomes my favorite late round rookie running back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, we'll targeting. just we'll do we'll do the same thing. It'll just be at the end of the second instead. <laughs> right. But he'll then immediately be a trade target when he pops because day three running backs you trade after year one. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Sean Tucker, he's, he's tough. I love the kid. I love the skill set, the ability. But it's just what's about to happen to him. I don't think is going to be fun. I'm not prepared for it. <laughs> <laughs> With the second to last pick, the 111 in our rookie draft here, we're going back to wide receiver, and it is probably not who a lot of you expect it to be. It is not Quentin Johnston. It is, in fact, Zay Flowers. It's not even Josh Downs, actually, which is probably a shock to people as well. I'm officially on the Flowers over Josh Downs hype train, and the reason is they, to me, are very, very similar players, right? From how they win to what they do on a field, how they can perform after they catch the ball. All of these things are very similar, except the big tiebreaker for me is we have seen Zay Flowers move around the formation. I'm talking in the slot, at flanker, right, out wide, anywhere else he needs to be, he can go ahead and do it, and he does it very, very well. We haven't seen Josh Downs do that, and that to me is not necessarily a red flag, but it's an indicator of ceiling because traditionally players that play on the outside – just have better fantasy careers, right? Obviously, you have your Cooper Cups who are just (laughs) freaks of nature, but that's not Josh Downs. He's not that big slot guy, right? So 
it's just a it's a it's a level of confidence I have in their ability to hit their perceived ceiling. And I think Zay Flowers has a better chance to do that with a very, very similar floor to Josh Downs. And based on news and hype and mock drafts, it seems like Zay Flowers is deemed the better wide receiver in NFL circles as well. So he should get the edge in draft capital as well, which does factor in here. So if he lands in the first round of the NFL draft, I don't see any other way I can move him lower than my wide receiver three right now. The first round draft capital is really the biggest sign for for Zay Flowers and and warrants this type of price in your rookie drafts. I, I know a lot of other people maybe even have Zay Flowers up ahead of obviously Sean Tucker, maybe even Addison, maybe even Charbonnet. You know, I, there are really hardcore Zay Flowers truthers out there too. Yeah, I'm not necessarily there yet. I still believe that Josh Downs is the better prospect, but there are feathers in the cap that Zay Flowers has that Josh Downs doesn't. And you hit on both of them. And the, the first one obviously being draft capital. And the second one is utilization in college. And, and you know, like Zay Flowers was utilized a lot more on the outside. And that kind of fits the bill a lot more with players of his kind of size that have succeeded in the NFL amazingly for fantasy. A la Tyler Lockett, I think is, is one of them. I, I like this pick. I'm not really against it. I just feel like I'm not going to be the guy that ends up drafting Zay Flowers because I feel like I'm just like a pick or two behind everybody else. So that's just kind of where I'm at. And I would happily take a discount on Josh Downs if it's, you know, two, three, four picks, whatever it is. After Zay Flowers, that's something that I would much rather do. 112, final pick in this first round of this Superflex rookie mock draft. I have to take him here. It, he's fallen a little bit too far, especially for a lot of people out there. I have to take Quentin Johnston, who is my wide receiver to begrudgingly over Jordan Addison and everybody else in the class minus JSN. I just, I don't like making this pick. I don't know what it is that I just do <laughs> not want to click draft on Quentin Johnston's name really at any point in the first round. Like if he's a second round player, I'm all for that. You know, totally easy. on board with that price. Easy, easy selection. In the first round, I just feels like there's so much opportunity for just failure overall with his type of profile. There's opportunity <laughs> for success. He definitely has one of, if not the highest ceiling at wide receiver in this class. But I just keep looking at the floor and I just feel like his probability and range of outcomes, it just leans more towards him being more of that floor kind of player, you know, like from the drops, the not really growth in production uh, from year two to year three i know he was like if you look at the raw numbers it looks better but he was he was hurt and missed half of the year in 2021 but in his pace numbers matches what he did in 2022 on a much better tc like he was no bigger part of a much better tcu team from 2021 to 2022 and, and i just I, I don't know what it is about quentin johnston that i just cannot get on board with him and like I said, he's just begrudgingly my wide receiver too. So if he gets first round draft capital, you have to have him here. He has to be a first round rookie pick, especially if he goes somewhere with opportunity like the Giants or the Vikings or the Chargers, somewhere that we've already kind of pegged as needy for wide receiver. I just, I don't want to hit draft. No, I'd rather trade out. And because when you watch the tape, like he has so much work to do like as a true wide receiver from concentration to route running to just inconsistency, his film is littered with like you watch a guy one play that you're like, he's the next DK Metcalf. This, how can anybody let him get out of the top 10? He's a star. And then you watch him and you're like, okay, he's might he's maybe never played football before. So like there are, <laughs> there are these massive swings and they're play to play. And it's just, it's so confusing. And I think you comped him to Brashad Perriman in one of your videos and that feels correct. Like Perriman had all of the tools. People thought Perriman was like the next dude, but he just didn't develop as a wide receiver. And I think Quentin Johnson is probably very similar to where Prashad Perriman was in his you know, evolution at this time as well. So it's going to come down to coaching and just his ability to work and improve. And that's a difficult thing to bet on because I think we often – oversimplify how easy it is to just become a better player in the NFL. Like there mm -hmm. is a lot that goes into that. And a lot of players never hit that next step. And I don't know if I think Quentin Johnson will or not. Like he very well 
could flame out in the next three or four years. And I wouldn't be all that surprised. We didn't just stop at pick 12, guys. Addison and I did finish this second round of the mock draft as well. Here it is on the screen. This is how our picks shook out. All right, guys, that is all we have for you. Again, if you have questions, you have comments, drop them down below. If you like what we're doing here at DLF, subscribe to the channel. Uh, check out the YouTube membership. Help support Addison and I as we do this year round. As always, guys, thank you for watching and we will see you next time. The dude puts mayonnaise in his coffee. Do I need to say anything? I, I forgot about the selfie, like the mirror pick until dude, this it, it was like him and like like a year ago, and then him now, and he's all like, it's like, just like this dude. He's just such a <laughs> weirdo. <laughs> he's so weird. Maybe that's why Franklin chose Clifford over him. He's just oh. he's like, I don't want this weirdo in my locker room. I was like, I know it shouldn't factor in, but it's starting to. <laughs> it's starting to. You know, oh, I just <laughs> I just keep playing that TikTok in the back of my head. I can't and stop watching. I'm down a spot. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs>